Go on then. Are you nervous? I, I am a bit. It's been a while since I've done anything like this. Like I said, I've been really? out. Of the, I've been out of the game for a little while because I've been. Const- I've, I've had my head in here for months now. Well, um, let's get so straight I'll, into it then. That was one reason I reached out to you just to see, you know, get back yeah, into yeah. the the whole Absolutely. promotion thing and get myself out there again. <laughs> right. Well, let's get on with it, folks. It's Jonathan, cool. Jonathan Hall and Son back again. Oh, it's lovely to be here. Lovely to see you. And you, Paul. And you. Um, yeah. A bit of a change from the last time you came on here. It was sort of yeah. February 23, I think, or January 23, the last time you were on. It's a couple of years, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Working yeah, in your yeah. shed, the back of the house. Yeah. I mean, that little workshop, it did me good. You mm-hmm. know, it gave me my start and I loved it. It was beautiful. And it's a little bit heartbreaking to walk into it now because it's just a pile of rubbish in there now. It's just an empty space with piles of rubbish in it, yeah. um, which is a bit hard to look at. But then I come down here and I go, ooh. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So come on then, behind you, anyone that's <clears throat> not watching the video, then Jonathan is now sat in like a... a, 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 a like a proper garage. <laughs> I mean, it's it's like a big industrial unit, isn't it? With the roller is, yeah. door at the back, bike ramp, yeah. loads of space. Yeah, well, I've gone from 240, 50 square feet, which sounds a lot because it's, because um, you're saying hundreds, but that's about the size of a normal double garage. So mm-hmm. that's the space I was working in. Yeah. Um, and then... I've now got 860 square feet <laughs> and I, I have a, I have a separate kitchen bathroom. Yeah. I've got, I've got an upstairs office space. It's uh it's crazy. And these, yeah, great big roller shutter doors to get in and out. I've just got room to breathe. You know, I'm not tripping over myself. So awesome. it's, so, um, it's massive for me. It's such a, it's such an upgrade, you know, what, what pushed this then? What pushed the decision to, to, move and upgrade so <clears throat> well i've been i've been trying for a long long time and the problem has always been um a the cost of it um and b the location mm-hmm. um and i've been looking i've nearly um taken units half the size of this for twice the money over the years wow. um i've i've got some very good friends on this industrial estate um, and I knew this one was coming up. Um, I'd got like an inside scoop on it. <clears throat> so I very quickly sort of put my name on it. Um, and it took about six months. I l- I've learned to keep these things quiet now. Yeah. Um, last time I went for a unit, I lost out on it last minute. So I kept it very quiet. Um, and I just sat on it for a little while. And then finally the people moved out that had it. It used to be a car body shop. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, I did everything in my power to to get moved it to get it and 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 put my name on it if you like. Uh-huh. So it was a process. It was definitely a process. But um, but yeah, I got it, and and I've got it for steel as well. It's you know it's it's half what I've been you know I thought I'd be paying, and it's right on my doorstep. So um, yeah. I I live five hundred yards up the road. Um, so it's, it couldn't have been better for me. Um, so I knew I had to have it. I'm, my, my wife says, if, if I set my mind at stuff, I just do everything in my power to get, you know, yeah. to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Um, and I did in this case, but what really drove it was productivity. I, uh, I'm not short of orders in general. Wow. Um, I'm not short of work. The problem has always been getting through them quick enough. Uh-huh. Um, and deadlines kept moving and I just couldn't, I couldn't work fast enough in the, in the, in the space I had, I was one bike on one bike off. I was constantly tripping over myself. I mean, it was only a matter of time before I set the place on fire or I had an accident or, you know, suffocated myself with gases or whatever. Um, <clears throat> so that was a part of it, but it was more like productivity. Um, Every machine now has its place um, with room around it to work. Yeah. Um, and I don't have to get anything out, set it up, you know, spend an hour setting a piece of equipment up to use it, oh. to put it away again, you know? 
Yeah, that um, must be awesome to have that. Yeah, well, I did a job. Somebody asked me to fit a new exhaust to their uh, for the the Malay um, mm. Malay bike that I built last yeah. year. Um, they bought it. The customer bought it back in, and he wanted a fancier exhaust for it. So I did that for him. It would have taken me a day and a half at my old shop. It took me two and a half hours, and it was done oh. in the air. So you know. Um, that's that's what I mean. It's that productivity, just being able to move quickly yeah. from one, you know. This week, we are supported by Ultimate Add-ons. Ultimate Add-ons are the premium manufacturer of mobile phone and action camera mounting solutions for motorcycles. With a kit, well, You know all the blurb. I read this out every week, folks. Folks, Ultimate Add-ons, they make uh, phone cases, uh, action camera mounts, loads of things like that, uh, auxiliary battery charger, charging ports that you put into the power points in your bike. They do all this sort of stuff. They're phone cases, they're shockproof, they're waterproof, they're dustproof. They mean that you can still use the phone as a phone you can still use the camera on your phone everything like that they don't get affected by any vibration from your bike the great bits of kit i've been using them since about 2018 i've had them on all of my bikes whenever i take a, a bike out to do a review it's always an ultimate add-ons case that is on there and i use that teamed up with Kali moto as my navigation when i'm riding no issues at all with any of the cameras on any of my phones since like 2018, maybe even 2017. Great bits of kit, folks. If you head to ultimateaddons.com and you use the code TPOT1, all, all one word, all written out, TPOT1, with the number 10, TPOT110, then you can get 10% off. So a huge thanks to Ultimate Add-ons for their ongoing and continued support. Are you the type of person that needs... Like, does clutter affect your mindset? Like, for me, my office is terrible. Like, I've I've just stripped this office out. It's just a little small nine by sort of six foot corner room that in the house that is my office, but it it fills up with just took so easily, and then that mm. that infects my brain then, and like, it really affects my concentration and like the ability to create stuff because my I've, I feel like I get brain fog. You know, I can't concentrate on anything. Absolutely. Are you I, like I, that as well? Hundred percent. I uh, and I think working that long in such a small space mm. um, really trained me to that. I mean, I've always been the same. I am. I'm definitely, and I don't say this lightly. I'm somewhere on the spectrum. I I have those tendencies, um, and I need clarity. Mm. And I, if if there's mess everywhere, I can't work, and I get angry. I can feel yeah, myself I'm, getting angry. I'm the same. And, um, I'm exactly the same. But even when I, even when you can see the place is tidy, now I've had a tidy up for you, Bruce. Um, <laughs> even when the place is tidy and I can still put something down and then three or four seconds later go to, and I can't remember where I've put it, you know, and then I've spent a couple of minutes looking for it. I'm still like oh, yeah. that all the time. Yeah. Um, but if you've got, if you've got that sort of mind and the place is a mess, you don't stand a chance, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I uh, and I think I've had some strong influences uh, working with the racing team recently, and uh, working with my friend Bob, who's my my friend Bob Moore is is a unit across there. Uh -huh. So now I'm dead close to him, which is amazing. He'll probably get sick of me now, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, keeping a tidy shop, tidy house, tidy mind, you know, and that's when you can be the most productive. You know, just clearing up after yourself. Absolutely. And you had yeah. Gus down as well, didn't you? Man Cave Makings. Oh, mate, that guy is an absolute gem. And <laughs> I said to him, if I could if I could afford to take him on, I would. Um, yeah. Having somebody else in the shop. And uh, we were like, we synced up mm -hmm. really quickly. Like, we were moving around the workshop and we didn't once get in each other's way. Um, and having somebody like him where I can just, at the start of the day, could you finish this side panel for me yeah could could you could you put me aside I, I need a tail tidy for this bike can you sort that out and then by the end of the day he's done it and it's beautiful <laughs> you know <clears throat> I toy with the idea of taking on an apprentice but it would be a labor you know training mm. somebody up and and being there with them all the time checking their work and stuff but having gus in you could just set him off and he's yeah and I think he's enjoying having something to do. He's he's uh, he's sat waiting for his his new house to clear everything yeah. to.
to go through on that. Um, and he's stuck for something to do. So I think he quite enjoys coming down and helping me out. Yeah, I bet he does. But, he's had he's yeah. had a bit of time off, hasn't he? Every now and then, yeah. he, he pops mm. up on the socials again, and he's he's somewhere, and he just does something, doesn't he? It's, it's the yeah. old guts. He gets back into it, and then he just disappears off the socials again. So. Well, the first time he came down, he built all these benches with yeah. me, <laughs> and and I was just going to nail and glue and screw some blanks of wood together, but he's dovetailed joints and everything. Yeah, I bet. Now, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Mega. <clears throat> We're also supported by the Influencer Store. The Influencer Store helps you build your brand, big or small, providing you with a solution and apparel. We help you to increase your fan base while supporting you with starting your own influencer clothing line with nothing more than just an idea or design. And there are no hidden costs. For more info, come check us out at theinfluencerstore.co.uk or drop us an email at online at influencerstore.co.uk for more information. Now, the Influencer Store, they do all my march over at Teapot One and for brew time so if you head to teapot1.com or the influencerstore.co.uk go to the teapot one section if you buy any of my merch you're helping to support the channel and the podcast so a huge thank you from me to you in advance and a big thanks to the influencer store for their ongoing support now a big shout out to all of you everybody who's listening or watching the podcast when you like the vids when you share if you comment if you leave a rating on the audio podcast either on Spotify or on Apple podcast or whatever platform you're listening to wherever it is if you rate the podcast if you share it with people you really do help to build the audience to get it picked up by algorithms and get it promoted out there so a huge thank you from me you've helped build this podcast to one of the top five motorcycle podcasts out there. And those of you over in the clan on Patreon, so it's patreon.com forward slash teapot one, you are a special, special bunch of people. I could not do this full time without your help. So a huge, huge heartfelt thank you from me. If you fancy checking that out, folks, if you fancy being part of the clan and coming on some of the weekend rides that we do, then head to patreon.com forward slash teapot one and see if there's anything that takes your fancy let's get back to the podcast um do you have a do you have a beverage for this evening um i'm on cups of tea and uh tonight and uh and orange and blackcurrant squash <laughs> that's that's can, me for tonight i'm afraid i can match you on the squash but that's for after oh, I've, got well, a, I've got a beer for just now so um, yeah. here's to your help. I'm, i meant to bring some down but i uh i totally no forgot no worries Slash. Right, you mentioned race team. What's the race team all about? Well, I got an opportunity um, to do some freelance work for a company called Minovation. Mm -hmm. And um, Minovation make um, mining equipment, right? So they make cooling jets for for really high-level mining equipment, you know, the, the big business end of boring and drilling equipment. Mm -hmm. And it, go, it goes all over the world. And they make – they've patented – these tiny cooling jets <clears throat> um, in, a, in a whole range and, and they engineer them in-house and ship them all over the world. Um, and it's an incredibly successful business. So I, uh, I got in touch with them because I really wanted some machining training, some manual machining training, um, old school stuff. Um, but in the back of my mind it was always that they have one of the most successful works racing teams in the classic racing motorcycle club history. Right. Right. So I, I knew this. <clears throat> so I got a job as a trainee engineer, uh, on the side, like a, as a, as a freelance. And then while I was there, uh, cause it's all in the same building. I, I was making sure that, um, my face was around the bikes and I was talking to Martin, who is the head of the racing team. Um, and they build matchless G fifties. They've got all the plans from, from matchless. Um, uh -huh. they build G fifties from scratch in the workshop using all the machinery, you know, and the only thing they don't do is ca engine castings. Right. So, so they have engines casted, um, but everything else, so you can get a brand new matchless G50 from them, uh, race ready, if you've got enough money. Like, um, wow, yeah. So it absolutely fascinated me. And uh, over the course of a sort of year, um, Martin, understandably, is he's, he's a bit like my friend Bob over here. Um, you have to work 
to get their res- you know those people you work to get their respect yeah because yeah, they, they get they get bombarded with people all the time wanting mm. stuff from them right so um over the over period of a sort of year martin has become a really close friend and he has been such an influence on me um and we obviously i when i got this new place i left there <coughs> um to really get stuck into my stuff but i still see martin and he still comes over um and he's you can see him and that motorcycle workshop of his all over mine you know there is there is effort there is evidence yeah yeah um and i wouldn't change that for the world i mean i went to a couple of the races i went over to croft um and uh you could see why they were the best team in the club and they have Mm. been for years they ended up uh they've retired from the racing scene this year having won the championship again um and uh Second place was a new first for all the other teams. They were that good. It was just, it was on the wow. cards. Minovation were winning every time on wow. these, on these G50s. Mm. And they are stunning bits of kit. Absolutely stunning. The engineering in them is insane. So yeah, I was really lucky, really lucky for that. Um, to have like those top level people around me. And of course, learning the engineering, the, the reason I went there was to learn to manual machine better. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and I've certainly done that too, um, working on those little jets and, and, you know, turning manual lathes and collet lathes and old bridge port milling machines. It's, it was a real education, you know, awesome. and I, it excites me learning. I'm, you know, I'm 50 years old, but learning is, is, does it for me. You know. Absolutely, and that keeps uh, uh, the way I find it is if if you're still keen to learn and you're still learning new things about something that you've invested hours or years of your life into, if you're still learning new stuff in it, it keeps it exciting for you, doesn't it? It keeps the passion alive. I think the appetite yeah. for that, whatever that thing is, absolutely. I mean, that's why bike building, um, custom bikes, whatever you want to call it. Um, that's why it is so interesting because it's changing all the time. And I've, um, I've gone right back now to engineering. That's what turns me on like really good engineering in a bike. Um, and I will spend hours on it. Um, <laughs> and I, I absolutely love it, but yeah. So nowadays then, are, are you working on multiple projects at once now then, or are you still just yeah. doing what, you know, one at a time, get that one done, move on to the next one? I am. I mean, you've seen a lot of this one recently, right? On the, <coughs> excuse me, on the socials. Um, yeah. I saw you were fabricating the, the light cowling. Yeah, that was hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. This bike was supposed to be easy because it's 2022 CRF. Yeah. It's not, it's done hardly any miles. Uh, it, it's a brand new bike almost, right? So I thought, oh, I'll be, I, I probably underquoted it by a considerable amount. Because I thought just just a cosmetic rebuild. That's all it Bish, is. Bash, bosh, I'll have it done. Yeah, but I've um, mm-hmm. you know that that took a week, a good week, <laughs> to, to, crazy. to sort that. Um, and then those aluminium, big aluminium side panels that I've had to fabricate. Um, and then these, the even the mud guards, they've all been hand built. Um, mm-hmm. Just and then getting over this the surfboard because the customer wants to carry a surfboard on the side. So that was an engineering as nightmare as well. Um, but we got there. I'm just waiting for the stuff to come back from powder coat and then it should be done. Awesome. Um, awesome. But yeah, uh, I'm doing multiple bikes at the minute. Um, but I'm having to catch up and playing catch up because it took me a good month and a bit to move into this place and, you know, get to that point. So I am behind again, but I'm, I'm catching up quicker. So what's the plan with the, with the new shop then? Is this going to be a, is this going to be a premises where like customer people can walk in off the street or is it still like your, your place? And if, if people want a bike, they can arrange a time with you to come and, you know, you yeah, go that's to- that's more like it. I mean, I don't. I'm not a sort of a passing trade business. Nobody's gonna yeah. because people are asking me if I'm gonna have a big sign out the front. Well, 
nobody's going to be driving up Bag Hill yeah. Lane and think, yeah. oh, I need to spend 25 grand on a custom yeah, motorbike. Yeah. On the way for some milk. <laughs> I'll just get <laughs> yeah. a custom motorbike. Yeah. So, um, yeah, um, I wanted it to be nice. I've got a lovely sort I've made a lovely sort of kitchen uh, reception area. Um, I haven't started my upstairs yet, but I've got quite a big office up there. Landlord's given me permission to put a big window in so you can stand in the office area and look down onto the workshop. Yeah. Um, but I wanted that to be kind of a lounge as well, like a sort of lounge coffee table, that sort of uh-huh. thing. Um, so I can have people around. We can be comfortable. You can sit and have a coffee. You can, you know, watch what's going on, mm-hmm. have a chat. So there is that aspect of it. I wanted it to be very sort of modern and professional when you walk in, but then still be a fully functioning workshop, you know? Yeah. Mm. Awesome. So that's the plan. Right. Um, we've got some questions to get through. I chuck stuff out, obviously, on the socials, but I did it on my Patreon as well. And we've got quite a few questions over on ah. Patreon for us to get through. And I think that'll or that'll open up. You know, you, you've you've done this before. It opens up all different avenues of conversation with the questions. So shall right. we tackle them just now then and see where it takes us? Yeah, we can, uh, by all means. Oh, track. there was a good one on Instagram. Yeah. Um I can't remember what, what it was, but I remember thinking that would be a good one to... Okay. To well, we got, we got half a dozen or seven questions. I think we've got seven questions on Patreon, and then there's a few over in the Insta as well for us to get to. So mm. let's get through these. So first one uh, over at patreon.com forward slash teapot one. Peaky. So that's a peaky biker. Hi there. After racing for many years, some things come and change the game, like the quick shifter on the Triumph. Um, seamless. Question to you. What's the most important upgrade and one you'll ask the customer to have for a bike when building it? See, that's difficult because I predominantly um, build cla- build bikes based on classic bikes. <clears throat> so most of the donor vehicles that I work on are 70s, 80s, 90s, early 90s. Um, and though some of those bikes like the K100 have been, were groundbreaking bikes at the time, right? Um, they're still, they're old machines, old technology now. Um, one thing that fascinated me on this one that I, I'd never come across before, um, was the ABS system on it. And the, um, it, uh, there's, so that was interesting to work on a bike with this sort of ABS because it works on a tilt sensor. Uh-huh. So there is a, there's a mercury switch tilt sensor in it. It senses how you bank um, and then applies that to the ABS. Um, so that was a fascinating. And um, having ridden that bike uh, as a stock bike for a couple of months before I took it to bar, I absolutely loved it. Oh. And I know, I know there's mixed reactions to the 300 Rally. Um, but for me, it was beautiful. I can see why people change the suspension and, and yeah, stuff like that. Everyone the says KT- it's quite soft, don't they? Yeah, the KTM is better on the on the suspension. Um, but so I'd swap that out. And I did discover why. You know, only one side is sprung and the, the other side's dampening. No, I didn't know. On the front oh, of yeah, these, yeah, yeah. That's right. so that, yes, that, yeah, yeah. that was new to me as well. I was convinced that somebody had not put a spring back in before. I was like, <laughs> what on earth is going on here? So, yeah, I think I'd change it for a couple of springers and, and, and get a decent sort of front end going on it. But the bike itself, I'd buy one. I, I would spend money buying a CRF 300 yeah. Rally. Yeah, One of the most popular ones out there, aren't they? For good reason. They're just, they're well, just really hard to get. I mean, that's another reason I underquoted on this because I wasn't expecting to spend six grand on a two-year-old donor bike because oh. there's, the waiting list is so long at Honda for a new one. It's driven the price of the second-hand ones up. Six um, grand for a second-hand one? Uh, nearly. I yeah, I, I paid, were five I paid, and a half grand brand new, weren't they? Th- this this particular one was six, six summer brand new. God, they've gone up. There was a wow. six-month waiting list, and I ended up paying, I mean, I got a deal. I ended up paying about five for it, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't far off. Um, So, yeah, I wasn't expecting that. And I did mm. consider, I said, did say to the client, shall we, should we wait and get a new one? You know, but I'm going to have to put the price up. But um, yeah, but he was he was adamant he wanted the 300 rally. Right. 
Gotcha. And I, I can see why. So yeah, that was a long winded answer to that question. Um, it's difficult for me. I've never ridden a bike with the quick shifter, so I can't really, um, have you not? No, no, but I've heard, I know I, I do read about things. Um, and, uh, there's mixed reactions. Uh, Bob buys these incredible bikes. He's got a, he's got a collection of, um, M3s and, uh, you know, uh, sorry, BMW M, mm. uh, Ducati Pinagals. Um, and he, he prefers a manual, even, even though he's only one leg, he does it all with a thought, you know, yeah. thumb shifts. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I couldn't really tell you about that, but, um, yeah. So that's, like, there's no, there's no modern gadget that you've seen come along that you thought, oh yeah, I I want that integrated. I, I tell you what, I mean, like, have, have you seen the current trend for autos, which kind of boils my piss a little bit on bikes, but on. there are some that are automatic. Some, some automatics, yeah. On, yeah, on you bikes. can. Um, it make sense, but on others, no. Yeah, you can put an automatic gearbox on a BMW K100. Because mm. uh, basically they're a car engine, right? I'm pointing behind me because I used to have one there. Yes, yeah, right. Um, yeah. So the, the, the K100 engine is basically a car engine, car transmission, everything. But um, there is a few people that have put automatic gearboxes in them. Um, you know, I mean, just because you can, it'd be interesting to do that. Mm. Mm-hmm. But you'd only do it once. And I couldn't imagine riding a bike with an automatic. I mean, what I used to have the Vespa when I was a kid that yeah, was just right. round and go, you know, that was fun. But, you know, otherwise, what's the point, you know? Unless yeah. you are, yeah, I mean, unless you're like, like Bob, you've, you've had an injury, you've lost your leg, you, you know, you might, that might be great for people with disabilities or differently abled. Um, but I think for a normal, sorry, I shouldn't have said normal there. Um, I think for, for able-bodied people, yeah, I think why, why would you, you just having a geared bike is, yeah. is somewhere else. Then, then, uh, for me, I, I rode Honda's DCT on their, on their big Africa twin. And I really didn't like it. I, I just, I just didn't gel with it and was kind of the same mindset as you. I just thought, well, if you can work the gears, why why would you choose this option for the kind mm. of riding that I like? But it's a personal thing, isn't it? Because it's for the kind of riding I like to do. Then I rode the Goldwing, and the Goldwing obviously has DCT, and it 100% fit that bike. And even, right. you know, that, that Goldwing's an amazing machine. You put it in sport mode, and the thing goes. It doesn't hang about. But DCT was even fun on that bike. And then I've ridden Honda's e-clutch on the, the CBR 650R. And again, you know, it was surprisingly good. But I, I I did think to myself, I would still, that e-clutch system, it still has a clutch. So if you want to use the clutch, you can. Alternatively, mm. you don't need to. You can just go up and down through the gears traditionally, you know, with your foot the way you normally would. And right. you don't you don't touch the, the, the clutch. And that was really good. And I actually thought to myself, I quite like this system because when you can't mm. be arsed and you just want to trundle around, you can just leave it in auto. Um, or alternatively, if you fancy riding it like a traditional bike, you can if you want. And it's also got a really good quick shifter blipper there, you know, in a sense. So you, yeah. know, you can gear change without it. But then yeah. I've ridden hot, I've ridden BMW's ASA. And I, I haven't published a vid yet because they ain't gonna like it. But um, <laughs> I, I hated it. I hated. I it. thought you see. I know you have a thing with a friend of yours about BMWs and KTM. So I thought yeah, I'd come yeah, on yeah. and put. Uh, I thought Fly I'd the flag. <laughs> yeah, I, I really didn't like the ASA on the Beamer in automatic. But when you put it in the manual mode and you just use the like the paddles, you know, going up and down the gears manually. Mm. It was a lot better, but it was still a really clunky gear change, I found. Yeah. Really clunky. Right. And KTM, KTM have just brought theirs out, haven't they? They've just announced it. Mm. So they've got they've got an automatic transmission coming. So let's see what well, it seems to be the know, trend, doesn't it? Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. I don't know whether um I don't know. I'd have to I'd have to ride one of the ones you're suggesting, yeah. I think, yeah. to to try it out. Um yeah. But I, I like, I like the the rawness of. That's why I love the classic bikes, right? Because yeah. it's just stripped back, you know, frame and engine. Yeah, make it go and yeah, I, I love that. Dropping, I, I, I'm 
I've fallen in love with the BMW K100 engine. I know people love it or hate it. But I, there's nothing like dropping a couple of gears in that and just bombing. Yeah. They are When you strip all the crap off a K100, they're actually really fast little bikes, you know, um, and they are, they are a hell of an engine if you know what to do with them. And you mm. take all all that excess weight that's on a that's on a K100 that you really don't need, you know. If you if you strip all that away, they become very fast little bikes. <laughs> you need to drop them a bit, drop them a couple of inches as well, so that engine's only about that far off the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, straight lines like nothing else. Beautiful. I um I just took my Jixar today in today. I can I can say this on a podcast because this won't go out till next week. But I'm keeping it as a surprise because I'll have one of my Patreon uh, meetups this weekend, like clan weekends. So I'm taking the Jixer up for that. You know, it's it, it's it's going to go up on the back of a mate's van and I'll be on my GS. And then when we arrive in the car park for the ride out on Saturday morning, I'll wheel the Jixer out and, and ride that for Saturday. So I've oh, had yeah. to get it insured and, and today <clears> was the MOT day. So I, I rode it for the first time. I've not been able to road test the bike at all since um, since we got it back on the road so today mm. was the first time i rode it and oh my god that bike is quick <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. There's, there's no gadgets on it well obviously that there are some you know it's fuel injected and all that jazz but there's no mm. abs it's got a slipper clutch but that's it there's no quick shifter there's no blipper there's there's none of the modern gadgets that i'm used to with the gs you know like wheelie control traction control all that there's none of that at all in this bike <laughs> And it was yeah. so good just to ride it again, you know, like just for me, what is a, to me, it just feels like throttle, chain, you know, throttle, engine, chain, back wheel, go. And it was just brilliant. I loved it. Had yeah. such a, what a hoot I've had today on that thing. So yeah. Oh, it's fun, wait. isn't it? I mean, oh, I loved it. Those, uh, when I, when I do the BMWs, I, I, I delete the ABS on them. Mm -hmm. You know, we put a S1000RR front end on it. Um, with us with all that stopping power, we half the, it's half the weight it, it, of the original bike. You know, mm. you stick a K twelve hundred rear wheel on it, um, and it's back to being just frame engine and the road. You know, it's uh, yeah, they're they're a blast. But it, there is something about that in there. Those fast, you know, fast bikes or that are just the basics. You know, yeah. Mm. And I used to think I used to think the inline fours. <laughs> I, I used to think there's, these things cannot match the big adventure bikes for the initial grunt. You know, like the the the, the grunt off the line. To me, mm. I always thought <clears throat> yeses and all the big adventure bikes, they'd pee all over the, the sports bikes to like sort of 40, 50 mile an hour. And then the sports bikes sort of start to take over mm. there. I tell you what, this thing, this blooming 2011 GSX-R thou that I've got, you, today it was just boom. There's there's yeah. no lull in it. It's got grunt everywhere. I don't That's know if it's amazing. just because it's loud. It's got a really loud and sort of burbly farty exhaust on it, pipeworks exhaust on it, which sounds amazing after a hundred thousand miles. You know, it's like yeah. there's probably no there's probably no dampening or padding in that exhaust at all anymore. <laughs> but um, it you sounds in it. Oh yeah, it sounds mint, and maybe maybe that makes me think it's going quicker than it actually is. Yeah, but, yeah. Oh, just a smile I've had on my face all day. It's like, oh yes, I've needed this. Mixed That's this. it, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah Sometimes smiles, modern smiles. bikes are too. They're they're almost too refined. That's that's been a, like a complaint of mine about the particularly this new thirteen hundred. Well, absolutely. Years. I mean, it's yeah, you're telling, telling me about the Goldwing, yeah, um, and the, the automatic. I mean. Mm. It's taken, um, it's, it takes the fun out of it for me. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a long distance rider like you, you know, I'm not, I go out joy rides on the bikes I build and I, you mm. know, um, and you know, I might do 20, 30 mile round trip. Um, and I, I just want to have, a, I just want to have fun, you know, no, no yeah. destination. I know I'm going to get back where I started. I'm just going out and blasting the cobwebs off and clearing my mind. And, you know, that's my riding style. That's what I like doing. Yeah. Um, I don't commute on them um, or, you know, go on big adventures, though I would love to. I'd love to have the time to, you know, go on some, you know, big adventure on one of my bikes. But, uh, yeah, it's, just, it's a release for me. 
Yeah, I guess so. I need to build myself a bike because yeah. I don't currently own one. I keep building them <laughs> for myself and then end up selling them. Um, so, yeah, I think I want to build a K for myself, maybe. I fancy cracking a go, uh, having a go at a, a Norton, an old Norton Commando, something like Do that. Do you? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've got ideas. Um, but, you know, I've, I've got to keep the business going now. I, you know, I've got four or five bikes on the books at the minute that I need to get going. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, it's never the time, really. Right. Cheers to that one, Brian. Uh, Peaky, Peaky Biker. Uh, next one, Thank Adam you, B. Evening. With the sidecar guy's world record attempt for reversing being a current topic, would oh, you wow. consider a custom sidecar project? Or is that against your mantra of not having anything unnecessary on a build? Yes. Have you heard about this, the world record attempt? Uh, of going back, sorry, going, no, going backwards on the sidecar. Yeah, yeah. So it's, I think it's a world record for the, I think it's for the longest reverse journey, I think. Wow. I well, that's, that's exciting. Yeah. Um, I when I was at Croft last year, um, there was uh, the sidecar teams were all up there, and I got drawn to them because they were using uh, the old boxer engines in them. Um, so they are what they were all R one hundreds, and I got chatting oh. to the guy. The guy, there's one guy that makes all the winning R one hundred engines for these sidecar bikes, and. Um, I was fascinated by the engineering in those things. Um, so uh, from a racing point of view, uh, the, the racing bike sidecars are absolutely incredible things. Mm. I'd love to have a crack at that. But I've always, I love the aesthetics of a, of a really nice sort of, you know, bullet, retro sort of bullet mm. Um, mm. sidecar. So, and I know my wife would absolutely love it. Um, so, yeah. I'm up for trying something like that, definitely. And uh, quite rightly so. I mean, my mantra, I'm a minimalist bike designer, um, and my mantra has always been, if it's no, if it doesn't make the bike go faster, stop faster or legal, then it's gone. Um, and then I get this to do, which is just because the customer, I, the customer sent me a challenge and I went, wow, I need to have a go at that. And that's just covered in aluminium bodywork, shiny, shiny, and a surfboard, for God's sake. And, so, and are you enjoying <laughs> this? Are you enjoying this, like the, the elaborate side of design rather than the yeah, minimalist? I mean, it's, it's massively so. time consuming, but this, mm. this bike has tested my fabrication skills and my engineering like no other. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, so I have enjoyed it in that point of view, and I think it's going to turn out pretty cool. I think it'll be a love it or hate it thing for everybody mm -hmm. else, but you know, it, as far as build quality, I mean, it's it's been a hell of a journey, and there's a lot going on. Um, but I would, I'm looking forward to getting back to my stripped back calves, you know. Um, right, Jonathan. Yeah, you brought this up: love it or hate it design. I'm going to ask you something. Go on. The new BMW R1300 GS Adventure. What are your thoughts? Right, I uh, I need to have a look at it again. I have seen it, and I know people are talking about it. Um, I you see. I'm not normally an adventure bike guy either, am I? Um, and then I, then this happened. Um, if you can call it, is it is is a 300 rally an adventure bike? Would you call it an adventure bike? Uh, I I am of the mindset. Any bike is an adventure bike. Any bike will let you go on an adventure. Any bike will go anywhere. Not any yeah. rider will. That's the, well, that's the way I look at it. There you are. Yeah. Yeah, there you are. Um, so, yeah, I don't think I'm qualified to comment on that, but um, I'd like to see it again. And I, I hated it when I saw the launch picks. Hated right. it. And then the next, literally the next day, there was a... There were loads of pictures on Instagram, and lo I, I didn't like any of them. A bar one, there was one picture of just a just. There was just a picture that made me go, "Ooh, I like the look of that." And then every day thereafter, I started to like it more and more. And now I've seen it in the flesh at um. At what did my you say dealership. it was? Thirteen hundred GS. Yeah, thirteen hundred GS A, thirteen hundred GS Adventure. I'm just gonna. I'm googling it as we speak. It does look like a Lego bike. But I've seen it in the flesh, and I love it. Just the things like the welds along the tank, they're stunning. 
It's just a beautiful looking machine in the flesh. He's gone quiet. I've gone quiet because it's. Uh... Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, yeah. That it's that blocky. It's that blocky front, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, I remember. Is, that. Yeah. Don't don't it be kind, diplomatic. It, it kind of works. I um. Yeah. It was. It wouldn't be the direction I take that in. But you know what? It kind of. It looks like an electric bike, doesn't it? It's. It's got. Oh, it, it looks know. like a. It, it kind of has that sort of nineties PC with wheels on it. But <laughs> I think. Have you ridden this? No, not yet. I. I will be next week. Well, very soon. I'm. I'm riding it. I'd be yes. interested in knowing. I mean, it's gonna. It's gonna be pretty good, isn't it? Honestly, mate, it's just interesting. It's interesting design, and I, I'm I'm up for people pushing the boundaries. Um, yeah, there's nothing like it. doing something, doing there's nothing something like different. That, yeah, nothing like yeah. That at I all mean, at the moment, um, the the one thing I do love about bikes is is they're so different to modern cars, where every modern car made and manufacturer uh, they're all reading the same playbook. They all, yeah. they all everything yeah. starts blending into one yeah. big grey and black lump. Um, and bikes have never done that, um, you know, to that extent. Um, so I'm all up for people pushing the boundaries, whether it's BMW or KTM or whoever. But yeah, um, yeah. Motorrad are great for doing that, though. You know, some of those great big, you know, two litre boxes are just nuts, aren't they? You know, oh, yeah. um, and. I was placed in the motorrad room at last year's bike shed show, and the bike to be in that company, the bikes in there were just nuts, you know. And again, pushing the boundaries, isn't it? Absolutely, um, and I think but, I think that's probably why that new adventure has got the reaction that it's had because it because it is so radically different to anything else. And with the with the standard mm. GS, of, I, I bought the standard GS, and that is all really sleek and smooth flowing lines. And it's so different than the old GS that a lot of people hated it because they said, oh, it's tiny, it's really tiny. It's, it's not physically any actual, it's, it's actually not smaller than the normal GS when you put them side by side, but just the lines and everything make it look much thinner and i've spent yeah. a lot of money buying stuff to bulk it out again you know to try and make you it, know what make it you know utility. i had my um yeah i have my half an eye when i'm doing this i know it looks like pretty boy and shiny and all that but when it came to the lines and the design of it i wasn't happy with the dais um image that i was given by the client they, they mm -hmm. sent me a picture of the dais crf that was built a few years back on the 200 or the 250. Um, and I wanted this, this was a bigger bike. It, it was the rally, you know, bigger tank, higher stance. Um, and I wanted this to look more muscular, like bigger shoulders. Yeah. So I started looking at the old Dakar bikes, you know, mm -hmm. from the, you know, the old classic sort yeah, of yeah, Dakar yeah. bikes. And they were like that massive shoulders all the way up front and i think that for an event for adventure bikes that that looks awesome i'd like to yeah. see them going back that way and that was the idea of these big triangular um sort of side panels on it so it had you know looked a bit like uh, you know sylvester Stallone, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or whatever you know you know so um yeah that's that's kind of what i'd like to see with the adventure bike scene just that somebody coming back you know, regressing oh, a, a little big bit. Take... Bike. A, a physically big bike again. Everything seems to be going. Yeah, but you they're, know, they're like trying... they've all like they've these massive shoulders and tiny waists. That's what yeah. them those old Dakar bikes looked like. They were yeah. they were cool, you know, all the way like a bulldog. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know. But I think and they were very high seated bikes as well, weren't yeah. they? You know, the notoriously high bikes. And mm. I, I the way it feels at the moment is the manufacturers are all trying to accommodate shorter riders, you know, male, yeah, female, well, whatever, but they're all trying to accommodate that market. But it leaves people like me out where I got into adventure bikes because I'm a 20 stone, six foot three, big fat lump. And those right, bikes right. fit me, you know, and I could jump on those mm. bikes and finally feel like I was sat on 
something that didn't make me look like a big gorilla with symbols. You know what I mean? <laughs> but all those bikes are now, they seem to be getting smaller now, or the seat heights are coming mm. down. And I, I feel like I'm getting more and more cramped on these bikes now. So I think that's part of the reason oh, I like the new GS Adventure is that it's such a physically big bike now. Yeah. I sit on it and was yeah. like, oh, it actually feels normal for me now. <laughs> well, that's great. And yeah, it's it's those considerations that we don't, all of us are thinking about, you know, um, but you're absolutely right. Uh, I don't know how you'd get on with one of my little straight back <laughs> calves. Um, but yeah. Well, I'd love to, I'd love to give one a shot. <laughs> well, next time I have a Beamer on the bench, I'll let you know, because uh, right, right. it'd, be nice, it'd be nice to get you out on one. <laughs> yeah. Um, have we... Yeah, we answered that one. That was Adam, wasn't it? Uh, oh, custom sidecar project. Yeah, you said you'd like to give that one a go. Yeah, I would at some point. Uh, that It is on my list, whether mm -hmm. that be a race, uh, you know. I do want to build a classic race bike, and that's probably because I spent time with Innovation. Um, I've even got fairings in stock and stuff. So I'd like to have a go at a classic race bike, and a sidecar is definitely on my uh, on my to-do list at some point, yeah. The I think I'd that. like. I think I'd like to fabricate the sidecar myself, though. I don't think huh? I'd want to go to a company and have one made. I think I'd. I'd be. Uh, me being me, I'd. I'd want to build it from scratch. I think. Have you ever written work? A sidecar? work uh, yeah, uh, very briefly, um, just round a round a car park because I wanted to go. Um, but no, I've never taken one out on the road. I do. What fascinates me is, you know, the engineering and all the. Yeah. You know, how, how making, making sure your bike can still yeah. tilt and you know, and oh, they yeah. follow, yeah, and, and the trail of them and getting into the maths involved that that fascinates me a bit, you know. So, oh, we've got a thumbs up now. What are these emo emojis all about? I don't know, <laughs> it's kind of cool though. <laughs> if, if you see me randomly doing this, I'm playing, yeah, I'm, I'm bored, yeah, yeah. And I'm playing with the remote. <laughs> <laughs> right uh cheers for that one adam next one rebecca christie evening both i'm trying to erase my memory after ah yes after mr giggles questions i've removed mr giggles questions mr giggles stop leaving that question please i'll not go into it he, he asks All the right. same question pretty much every week and it's almost not the, every week. was it the yellowstone one uh, no. had a, we had some random question about yellowstone yeah, that's on, on Instagram, Instagram, that one. Yeah, yeah. Right. Mr. Giggles just keeps asking about jizz in a beard. Don't even oh, go there. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> never mind. So, Rebecca <laughs> says, uh, I was admiring both... Oh, however, I was admiring both your beards. Thanks very much. Cheers, Rebecca. Anyway, Jonathan, is it hard maintaining that cool demeanor 24-7? Your bikes are works of art, and if I had one, I would have to go into a clinic and get worked on for a month before I could match up to that level of cool. Oh, bless you. Um, <laughs> that, that, who was that? It's Rebecca. Rebecca oh, Well, Rebecca, thank you very much. Um... I kind of, I think, I think, you know, from last time, I kind of fell into that sort of uh, what we call the new wave cafe racer scene. Mm. Um, and um, I kind of fell into it by accident. Um, and then I've sort of carried it on. I think, um, I know, it is a bit trendy. And, uh, uh, you know, oh, it certainly was at the time. And I... Um, I'm less about that now, um, but I think good engineering speaks for itself if, if, yeah. and good design, you know, um, form follows function, all that. Um, and I think my cues, my, my own design style just fits very well with that sort of mm. trendy scene, if you like. Um, but um, yeah, it's cool. Thank you. <laughs> is there an element of people wanting to back Britain, back made in like a, a made in Britain company, company that's out there I mean, producing stuff here in the UK? I hope so. And I mm. certainly, I am passionate about, I'm a, I'm a passionate patriot, I'm passionate about Yorkshire in particular. Um, even though I wasn't born here, you know, I've been here for the, you know, 95% of my life and I absolutely adore it. And the, and the talent that we have in Yorkshire is incredible. I mean, and the heritage, the engineering heritage mm. for starters, 
But um, this little pocket of West Yorkshire I'm in has some of the most amazing things going on that people wouldn't realize. Like in this little industrial estate alone, I've got a guy that builds Formula 3 cars to the highest level next door. I've got Bob building pre-65 trials bikes at the highest level. I've got an engineer that it's, it's a huge business and they make steam engines. If you can believe it, there's a mark, there's such a huge market really? to sustain this massive business building classic steam engines. Um, we've got, you know, Minovation racing just down the road in Wakefield building world-class race bike, classic race bikes, all within, you know, the, this, this tiny pocket of West Yorkshire. It's nuts. Um, we've also got Why the guys that? that, I don't know. Um, we've got Raven works, uh, just down the road. Um, good friends of mine, uh, Raven works there churning out beautiful sort of big block American muscle cars, uh-huh. um, and all kinds of like mod Japanese mod cars. Um, yeah, it's crazy. I think, I think we are, cre- you know, we have this engineering heritage, but we're also very creative with it, I think. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the work ethic as well. Um, the skills it's, it's yeah i hope people buy into bi- built in britain i mean a lot of my bikes donor bikes aren't british but i you know they're rebuilt here in yorkshire and uh, yeah and i think i try and use local people if i have to contract anything out mm. i don't like sending things all over the country i like to try and keep it in the local community if i can and i'm lucky i'm lucky for that because we've got some of the best in the business here you know? yeah Future sounds bright. Um, yeah. Rebecca has a bit of a random question next. I'll go on. Question for both. If this mission to one of Jupiter's moons successfully finds that it can support life, are you moving? Are you taking your motorcycle or the wherewithal to build one suitable for the terrain when you know what it's like? You've got <laughs> the great work. This is where the adventure bikes come in, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. I uh, I'll change it. It's all very exciting. I love innovation, space travel, all that sort of thing. I think it's brilliant. Um, and seeing that footage recently of them of SpaceX catching the super heavy, um, I mean, that was... I thought it was a, a film. Absolutely insane, that is. And um, what a landmark achievement. Um, I think Darth Musk is one step close to building his Death Star on Mars. But, um, <laughs> you know, in itself an incredible achievement and you know but he did have to throw hundreds of billions of dollars at that to make it work you know yep. could have yeah, probably yeah. been better spent you know fixing world hunger and stuff but anyway um yeah i'm into all that and if i if i got the opportunity or my children got the opportunity to move to another planet i think that'd be incredibly exciting um i'm way too old for that now i'm guessing but Man, the way yeah. the way things are going, the, the way technology is progressing, who knows? Jesus, mm. who knows? You know, you think five yeah. years ago, what five years ago were we anywhere near what where we are now? Mm. Was any was this being talked about five years ago? Not, I don't think it was being talked about to the levels that it now is. Mm. You know, interplanetary, genuine, it's a, realistic, it is, achievable. It is a, absolutely nuts, but I do think we have we have issues close to the home that the money would be better spent on right now. Um, But, you know, we've got these massive corporations and these big corporate leaders that, 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 uh, you know, throw in their wealth at it. Mm. Um, And, and in fairness, Mr. Musk has done what NASA spent, you know, couldn't do in all their, their time. And, and, uh, because they've got the funding, haven't they? They've got the money mm. now. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can't. I can't take any. Even though I don't perhaps agree with it, you, you've got to admire the engineering and the skill that went on in in catching that thing. Um, I, it, the footage is insane, isn't it? It's just I mean, my wife watched crazy. it. My wife watched it, and she didn't really understand the gravity of that. Yeah. You know, and fair enough. A lot of people will watch it and think, "Well, so what?" But you know, what an achievement. Um, it, for, for me, yeah. it was, do, you, do you remember the first time he managed to land the boosters when the boosters actually came back to Earth and landed on the platform yeah. where they were supposed to land? Because yeah. have you have you seen the film? The film about um, 
Elon about his no, sort of, no, no. like his his own space race. There's a great film. I think it's on Netflix or it might be Amazon. But it's fantastic sort of drama documentary thing that follows it. Mm. And as you said, I mean, the bloke nearly he, he nearly bankrupt himself in this quest to get to space, you know, and, and make mm. it attainable and achievable. And the amount of times that these rocket boosters would, you know, they would either blow up on launch or they would you know they would take off and go up into the sky then blow up and then it was like right how do we get it back down and the amount that just plummeted straight to earth or the yeah. loads of issues happened and then that one time when it came back and it actually landed where it was supposed to land and then the progress that seemed to from that one time when it was successful the progress from then onwards was just phenomenal well that what would be interesting to see is how many you can catch from now on you know mm. Have uh, as he nailed it now, or you know, um, you know how much how much of that how much of that recent one was <laughs> was just good luck, and how much of it was repeatable, you know? Who knows? Um, yeah, I can't imagine. I mean, there's got to be some crazy AI going on in that figure in all this. I mean, it could be just a chain, like a couple of knots in wind speed, and yeah. it could be all over, you know? Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. So when you consider the forces at play. Um, absolutely insane. Um, but yeah. Have you seen his, have you seen his new robot that he's just launched? Well, I am not a fan, as you probably <laughs> well know, well realized of Elon Musk. I, I, I think he is Darth Vader or Emperor <laughs> Palpatine at worst. Um, I just, uh, yeah, I, uh, I think I, I, um, if, do you want to talk about electric bikes and electric cars? Because um, yeah, 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 no problems. This is my thing, right? I uh, we all we all know it's not about the environment, don't we? Mm. Oh, hundred percent. The, the move to electric, we, oh, yeah. but a lot a lot of people still don't. But most of us have figured that out. Yeah. Um, that it's nothing to do with looking after the environment. It's nothing to do with uh, global warming, and it's everything to do with control. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what scares me. Um, it's financial control and it's, uh, physical control. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, but if, if you, you've got a brand new iPhone on a contract, right? If you miss a payment on that phone, what happens? Yeah. Turn the phone off. A couple of days later, they turn the phone off until and they hold you to ransom until you can pay it. Right. Mm -hmm. You imagine that with a Tesla, you just mm -hmm. bought a Tesla, your circumstances change. You miss a payment, all of a sudden they've turned your car off. I mean, it'll mm -hmm. go that way, and it it worries me that um, the technology that is going to go into telling you where you can and cannot travel, absolutely uh, monitoring where you go, stopping, when you go, monitoring mm -hmm. you go, eventually stopping you go into certain areas or certain places, like your car will physically not allow you to go mm -hmm. somewhere, and the implications of that. Uh, law enforcement potentially being allowed to take control of your vehicle, um, you know, um, and the emergency services and all that sort of stuff. How far does that line blur down the road when, you know, could, could, you, could somebody put an injunction on you and not allow you to go to a certain place? And you might argue that if you're a law-abiding, affluent person that could pay the bills all the time and behave themselves, then it shouldn't be a problem. But, you know... Mm -hmm circumstances can change i'm old enough to know mm -hmm. that your whole life can change in an instant and then you know um so yeah that worries me that financial physical control and i think that's what it's all about um, yeah absolutely and, I, I totally agree yeah with that. that's what that's what worries me about that thing and and elon bless him knows all this very very well there's not enough lithium on the planet um, we're swapping one finite resource for another one, and lithium mining is poisonous. That's exactly what yeah, I've been absolute, saying. All absolutely yeah. poisonous. I mean, we're devastating massive areas of rainforest and natural beauty with, with lithium mines, poisoning communities. It's not, it's, it's nothing to do with the environment. It's, you we're know. robbing Peter to pay Paul with this. That's oh, all we're absolutely. Doing. That's yeah. all we're doing. And if anything, yeah, like petrochemicals, petrol, traditional petrol engines and the, the, um, they are now so much more efficient than they were. They're probably actually less damaging on the environment. This is me pulling it plainly straight out my arse because I'm not a scientist and I have no access to any um, 
papers or any research in it, but I would suggest it's probably less damaging on the environment and on a whole now to have a well, the, the uh, carbon footprint involved in building a Tesla is a way more fuel. than it's way more than building a normal car. And then what I happens mean, afterwards? You know, three, yeah. four, five years down the line. Then what happens yeah. to that? It's it's mm. poison. Where does it go? Well, it's just going to be dumped somewhere, isn't it? Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, but people fall for the con, don't they? Oh, and yeah, they, yeah. you know, and um, it's just it, it's frustrating. It, I, I'm old enough and wise enough to see a con now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, and I can see this. Like, it's like why? You know, the uh, we need to be investing in in you know cleaner. Um, cleaner fuel so I think that's the way to yeah. go um, yeah. and yeah. Uh, I know Porsche and BMW were putting a lot of money into into fuel research weren't they but I don't know how far it's going or whether they'll be allowed I mean the co corporates, corporations just shut people down nowadays don't they and um, yeah but there's trillions now being invested into electric EVs so you know that's obviously where we're going to go for the foreseeable till they recoup some of that investment. Yeah, and then the, well, we're the sleepwalking. We're sleepwalking into losing our freedoms. That's what. 100%. That's what scares me. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. and at the same time, the abolishment of cash. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, I'll probably sound like a dinosaur to a lot of people, but you know, these are personal freedoms that we need to hold there. We ought to be able to jump in a vehicle and go wherever we want, whenever we want, and mm -hmm. you know, have that freedom. China, um, China has the the credit score. They have the universal credit score over there, whereby right. you you are tied in to your finances, and mm. by tied in, I mean everything that you do in life is monitored by the government. So if you say anything on social media that they don't agree with, then they lower your credit score, which that means yeah, you've, well, I you've, mean, you know you've got a reduced ability to get any mm. money they can cut your money off completely if they want and they can already they already track everybody where everybody go where that's any, it i mean that's the whole reason goes. for get it's the reason for getting rid of cash that's right what, that's it's, what yeah. our like they yeah if it's digital the they can you know mm. if it's digital they can turn you off um and what happens is the poverty gap just is mm. going to in it's just going to get so big. I mean, it's already terrible, the poverty gap. But, um, you know, people are going to be priced out of driving. People mm -hmm. are going to be priced out of, commute, you know, uh, of being, of having those freedoms. Um, and that's uh, that's really sad. That's that's what's scary, you know. It Sorry, was I went on a big old rant. <laughs> well, mate, you know, that's what this podcast is all about, you know. It's just well, there you go. two people having a chat. Um <laughs> It's interesting that about Elon Musk because not that long ago he went on Joe Rogan for the first time and Rogan was pushing him about AI because Rogan could see AI coming on the horizon and he was very, very wary of it. And mm. Elon Musk was almost anti-AI. He, you know, in his own style, his own unique way, he was kind of like... Very matter of fact, he said, you know, this can either be the best thing for humanity or it will be the end of humanity. Yeah, I will. And I can said, agree. Yeah. yeah. And he said, I think we are we are probably already approaching, if not already over the hill to stop this. So it's going to be a, a question of do we allow it to happen and just see what happens or do we try and get hold of the reins and you know, get some sort of control over this. And he yeah. wasn't entirely sure what he was going to do. The next time he came on Joe Rogan, which was probably less than a year later, he's fully embraced AI. He's gone for it in every mm. sense. You know, it's like, mm, yeah. I wonder what he knows that made him do that then, where he just went, right, okay, let's go for it. Yeah, the problem is, I mean, he's obviously an incredibly intelligent man, but he's, he's also a bit, crazy and he so oh, you know <laughs> that's, that's the bit i have trouble with you know <laughs> he's uh yeah i can't i don't i get what he's saying though i mean ai is scary right but it is mm. you know we are at a turning point and it is incredible what it can do we've just mm. got to make sure we're safeguarding um certain aspects of ourselves and we're not just blindly turning our, our lives over to ai you know oh, yeah. um I don't like it in the creative industries. Um, you know, I, I worry about the poverty gap and it just taking over. Um, mm. And uh, what is going to happen to society when, you know, nobody's working?
Yeah, that's absolutely. it, you know. Yeah. Um, Do you yeah, follow Gary's economics populated. at all? No. No. All right, he'll be worth you. Get on YouTube and just really? type in Gary's economics. And he's right. a young he's a young English lad who be, got into uh, investment banking um, very young. He's he's he comes from like a council upbringing, you know. He, he basically he's dragged himself up from the not the lowest of the low, but you know what I mean. He's come from a very very working class background, and he's just has an incredibly gifted mind that allows him to grasp figures and he, he gets statistics he gets that sort of stuff you know like the the investment world he gets yeah. that yeah. um so he's he sort of went into that and very quickly he became the top earner in the world you know he he, wow. he has made hundreds of millions through that mm. and um i think he retired at like in his mid 20s but he he is now on this big drive because he's like you know we we are at a precipice again, like what you've just said, where we're going to eradicate the middle class and you're just mm. going to have this huge gap between the yeah. uber rich and the very poor. And he said, and we, we yeah. are just hustling towards that at the moment and nobody seems to be addressing that or realizing it. And he said, it's as plain as day. Here it is. So he, well, gives we these, are, like I said, we are sleepwalking our way into yeah. that society and all of those films you know those apocalyptic films mm. that we saw in the 80s and 90s have been showing us this for years and we are we're, sleep, oh, yeah. we're sleepwalking our way have, into haven't it they? Yeah. oh we've been we are being trained up for the apocalypse uh, i swear um with all the media and stuff that's gone on in the last 20 years it's like somebody is you know you we'll sound be, like be, a mad if there's a, theorist, if there's a zombie you? apocalypse coming up i'm well <laughs> i'm sorted I thought I'm that sorry. was happening with COVID. I was like, right, 28 <laughs> days later, this is what's coming. Yeah. I'll be fine. To that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Check him out, Gary's Economics. He's, it's, I will it's do, really, yeah. I, it, I, I've, I, I think I've heard of it, yeah, and I might have seen a few videos. Uh, He's but big will, on social will, media. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, okay, cheers for that one, Rebecca. Next one, Andy. Evening both. Hope you're all well. A couple of questions if I may. If you could design a bike for anyone in the world, whom would it be and why them? Ooh. That's interesting. Um, it would have to be somebody well-known um, for loving bikes. and uh, uh, But at the same time, I don't just want, you know, it wouldn't be somebody... Whoa. Can we bring Steve McQueen back to life? Oh God! Um, I I would build him a bike in a second. Um, it's a bit of a cliche, I guess, but um, Keanu Reeves. I love that guy's passion about motorcycles. Yeah, yeah. Um, the way he talks about riding, um, it just ticks all the boxes for me. Um, don't know. Henry Cole. <laughs> there's a left there's a left field one wow. yeah, yeah. Like, Keanu Reeves, I, I, I would, uh, yeah that's a bit left field um i love that guy um i'd love to spend some time with him um but no um yeah or uh the walking dead fellow what's his name I, why can't i remember oh um oh god uh really interesting Reedus, norman norman Reedus. norman, norman yeah, yeah. um Somebody like that. Yeah. Somebody who is crazy passionate about bikes and then yeah, yeah. I'd give them one of mine and they'd hate it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, but I'd love to. Seriously, that'd be, it'd be a game changer, wouldn't it? Um, did you ever see that chat yeah. that Norman and Keanu did about bikes? Mm. They just, I think they were sat in the salt flats and they were just yeah. chewing the fat about yeah. motorbikes, weren't they? Awesome. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, who else is there? Ewan McGregor, I guess. Um, there's all these these big, you know, I really like what he did with the around the world trips and all those, you know, long way up, long way down. Um, They're doing another one, aren't they? They're doing... Are they? Him and Borman. I've yeah, met Charlie think, a couple of times. I think they're doing it on, I think that it's like a, I'm, I'm going to say this, but like like a proper around the world trip. So like what what we what is attainable for normal people. I think that's what they're going to be doing is, and mm -mm. I, I, I almost don't quote me on this because I, I haven't 
looked into it in any real depth, but just what I've heard on the grapevine was it's going to be like just Charlie and Ewan and off they go, you know, and they film it like, you know, like, like I would for YouTube. It's just, you know, what, um, well, that'd be lovely, but I think I spoke about them last time we were on, but Levi and Ollie, uh -huh. um, following their trip around. Is it, have I got that right? Levi and Ollie. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Yeah, following their trip around the world. I mean, that was that was insane. Um, they are such lovely people, and the way they documented that journey, um, the ups and the downs, the challenges, mm. the joys. Um, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, followed that really intensely. So, mm. yeah, similar to what you're saying, just that you know, getting uh, they just get up and do it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's cool. Be interesting to see what they do with it. I hope I hope they do do something like that where it is just it is just them because I think that's these days a lot of people criticise long way round and long way down and all that because of the big production team that went with them. But you know, like I always say to people, people weren't we didn't have the technology that we have now back then. You know, no, two thousand and absolutely, yeah, yeah. We didn't have that technology to create. Yeah, we couldn't do 4K Production films on it. Yeah. 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 When I went, it was like a 7 720 was just in. I had the Hero mm. 1, the GoPro Hero 1, and mm. that was 720. That was cutting edge then. You know, yeah. it was like looking at some cheese. It was terrible quality stuff. But um, mm. yeah, it'd be interesting to see what they do now and, and how it compares to the likes of, you know, Lavi and Ollie and everyone else that's out there putting stuff yeah, yeah. up on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll see. Uh, second question from Andy. How do you avoid your passion becoming just a job or a paycheck? That is a good question. Well, there you go. That is a good question. Um, and doing what I'm doing is not, it's not been easy. Um, and I, as you know, from last time we spoke, I left a very, you know, well-paid, um, safe job mm -hmm. to do this. And there has been moments when it's nearly broken me. Um, there has been times when, you know, I've not been able to pay bills. Um, the, you know, we've been worried about the mortgage. We've been, you know, we've not been able to do the things we used to. And um, there has been times when it has broken me. Um, but I'm, you know, it's a few years on now and I'm still here and I'm still fighting. Um, there are times when, you, you know, I had this with music too, because music was my passion and then it was my job. And so I'm used to dealing with that sort of balance. Yeah. Um, and the trick is to find, you know, find your joy in things. Um, some builds that I do, and they're usually ones that have been, you know, heavily when you, when you get a client that is too involved, mm. um, and I say that in the politest way. Um, any creative person doesn't do their best work when they are being steered. You need to be left and yeah. be, you know, you do your best work when it's you and you're focused and you're following your passion. I'm lucky that most of my clients know that and they trust me. They give me a basic outline of what they require and they just let me go. Yeah. And that's when I produce my best work and that's when I'm loving it. And that's my passion. Um, I've actually really enjoyed this, even though I was given, I was given an inspiration pick and, uh, cause the, the, the customer wanted this style of bike and that was the Deus 250 rally, uh, it's 250. Um, and I took that inspiration and I got stuck into it, but I've, I've really enjoyed that, even though it has been very tightly sort of managed, if you like, um, the most enjoyable build was the last K100 I did, and I had a, I had that, I have that perfect client. Uh, Brent is just amazing. He trusts, he trusts me, trusts me what what I do. He gives me the time, the space, and the crew, and, and and allows me to do it. And in return mm. for that, he got one of the best bikes I've ever built. You know, yeah. Is that, um, is and that, with that's that's the key. The balance is the key is to is to find the enjoyment. Um, 
if if you're getting stressed about it and it starts feeling like a job, you know, if you're passionate about something, you can find that enjoyment again. When I was a musician, I used to play a lot of play a couple of bands that I really wasn't into, but it paid me money. Mm. But you know, uh, the one the ones that I really loved, even though I could be one minute I'd be on stage with a band in front of thousands of people and and you know and not having the best time because I didn't like the music. What I really loved was jamming with three or four musicians, you know, in a jazz band in a restaurant with three or four people listening. Yeah, if that, yeah. and you just get to be creative and, uh, you know, kicking off each other and that, you know, that was the joy. So, yeah, you have to, like, you have to, sometimes you have to, you have to look for it, but yeah, it's, uh, it's not always easy. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know, it's, well, everybody I've spoken to who's, who's gone down the route of, you know, being self-employed and, and turning your passion into your career, your income, mm. everybody faces that, you know, it's, it's it's not it's not easy, but the the, the benefits the, the benefits outweigh it, but the minuses and the downtimes are just horrible. <laughs> horrible. Yeah. The you know, the like thing is that the, the, there's only you that extreme. can fix it, right? So yeah. yeah, yeah. If you're having a hard time, um and like I said, there's been times financially where we've we've struggled. Um I still love what I do. Um, and I'm privileged. I fight for that privilege to do what I do every day. And then sometimes I, I win and sometimes, you know, I, I'm, I lose. But, you know, if you're passionate about something, you keep fighting for it, don't you? Yeah, I absolutely. know I'm never going to be massively rich doing what I do, but, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a balance. It's finding the joy. And um, to be honest, I was never very good at sort of working for other people. <laughs> I was never, I was never a yes man. Um, and, uh, increasingly I was, you know, we, we were all, you know, if you weren't a yes man, you were against the grain, you know, if I, I, if I exactly where you're coming from. Yep. <clears throat> yep. We've talked this through before. Haven't you? If I see something being done wrong, I'd usually say, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, people managers don't like that, do they? No, no. Yeah. In, in, what what I see as incompetence really annoys me. Really annoys me, especially if, like if I see somebody in my old life. If I was to see somebody in a supervisory role above me, they're getting paid more. They got more responsibility. But you look at them and just go, "You're fucking incompetent at what you do." Like there's no logic mm. to the decisions that are being sent down this trickle yeah. down in this path. Yeah, and you just think, why? Like if I if I fuck up, then my ass is is in that sling straight away. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. I am having to answer for it. But it, yeah. it felt like the higher up you went, you just you were never answerable for your cock ups ever, ever. Yeah, and it yeah. Just, or they just really upset somebody you. else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's uh, yeah. the way the way of the world. So uh, yeah, I am I am better, and I feel like I'm building something. You know, I feel like. Uh, I wanted to build something that was mine and not yeah. just work for somebody else for the rest of my life. Um, I, I think I get that from my father as well. Um, just wanted to have something that was me, you know? Yeah. And if I can, you know, leave this planet with a load of my bikes out on the road, um, leave some sort of legacy that way. Um, and my kids into it too. My kids love yeah. it. So, Yeah. How how are how are they like? Are they are they at a point where they can come in the workshop now and? Oh, and they, I mean, twice a week, twice a week they have to come here before school. Yeah, um, and uh, and they love it. Um, Martha yeah. is at the age where you know she's riding. I mean, she was riding when she was six. She's nine now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we bought her a bike uh, last summer. She did the she did a first engine swap. I don't know whether you saw that. So mm -hmm. we we got a little we got a little fifty cc two stroke uh, yeah. we bought for her and we've custom built it so it was it was all pink and beautiful, um, but then we decided we wanted to put a faster engine in it so I talked <laughs> her through it I just sat there and she took the engine out and uh, wow. you know and put a new one in and then day after we uh, took nine. it for a shake she 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 took it she was eight at the time took it down uh, took it down the fields for a shakedown ride yeah. And that wow. was a proud moment. So that was very cool. Um, Ted's a bit more cautious, um, but he loves the whole idea of 
of riding a bike. He's got a little mini moto, but he uh, he has yet he don't go on it at the minute. It's a bit daunting for him. Um, but he is up on two wheels. He's doing the electric. I built him a little electric bike, electric motorbike, and he's he loves that. So Amazing. we'll see where they go. I mean, yeah, Martha yeah. Martha was ra- uh, did the kids race at Mallee Mile um, when she was seven. Yeah, six and a half, seven years old. Um, first time she did that, um, and she was better than most of the kid, the boys. You know, yeah. all the boys were riding around the ramp. And they don't go off it. Martha was just straight up fearless, <laughs> fearless, getting there awesome. at six. Yeah, yeah, brilliant, man. That'd be cool to see. I mean, that must be such a nice feeling, you know, to to have been putting in all the effort and the work that you've been putting in over the years, and you know, the vision that you have for the for the business, and to see your kids coming through and. Sp- particularly Martha now, you know, she seems to have this appetite for it. That must be awesome to think, mm. oh, it must give you even more of a drive now that, okay, right, we really got to make this work. So there's, there's, there is that path for, for them to move into if that's what they want to do. Yeah, of course. And that's, that's the idea of building something. Um, yeah. My, the problem is I keep, I keep reaching for stuff and I reach like I was reached for this and then, you do everything in your power to get it. And then you go, go, then you step back a month later and go, Oh crap, I've got to maintain this now, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, anyone who's ran a business and a premises know the overheads that are involved in it. And you're going, Oh my God, I've got to, you know, we've got yeah. to do this now. Um, so yeah, that is, it's a pressure, but yeah, building something, you know, for my family and, you know, I uh, get emotional if I think about it too much. But um, I bet you do. I yeah, bet you, do. you know, I, I uh, you know, my dad was a, is a massive influence on me, and I want him to see me doing. You know, he's getting yeah. old now. I want him to see me making the success of this as much as uh, as much as I do my uh, my kids and my family. But um, I'm lucky; I've got an incredibly supportive family around me. You know, my wife's amazing, Rachel. She's uh, my absolute rock. And I can be a pain in the ass if I'm having a tough time, uh, like most blokes. Or I just do that bloke thing and shut myself down, you know. You know, so she puts up with a lot, but yeah, amazing woman. (laughs) Cool one. Uh, Andy also says, finally, Bruce, if you had to have a custom bike, which style would you want? Oh, go on, Bruce. Oh, blimey. Hmm. Had to have sounds a bit like a punishment, though. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I? If you I could really get like, to have one, what would it yeah, be? If, if, yeah, if you were lucky enough to have a right a custom bike, what style would I have? I really like like a V. I really like engines or character, so something like a V four or mm. or the the. KTM, the L, what do they call that engine? Is that an L8 or something? Whatever their L engine is. I really right. like that style of engine. Um, although, you know, the big the big boxers on the R18s, mm. I've, I swear they are, they are nowhere near their potential because I thought they were going to be a fantastic engine to, to ride. And they just feel a bit, again, too refined, like too too restricted you you just want the animal yeah. to come out in them you know what i mean well I, I reckon with a bit of work you could coax one of those into something oh, amazing um like i said the same same with the uh the k100 they are they are a very tame bike when you ride those old police bikes you know um but when you uh with a bit of work you can really make them raw and uh i think uh you can do that with any engine you know they uh um, in, in terms of what style, that's why the bike, custom scene's cool, isn't it? Yeah, because you can. Well, yeah. literally, your imagination is the limit, isn't it? So yeah, that's yeah. it. Off you go. I there's there's one bike that I've ridden that has genuinely just made my soul smile. Probably because oh. I wasn't I wasn't expecting it to be the experience it was, and it's the Fat Boy. It's the Harley Fat Boy. I hate right. to say that, really. But, yeah, but <laughs> I was not expecting it to be the 
like the experience it was. You know, I thought they were going to be a bag of shit to ride. I thought they were just going to be horrible things. Didn't expect to enjoy it at all. And I, I just had a whale of a time. You know, like that turn the twist of the throttle and you feel everything. You, you feel the fuel being delivered to the engine and the engine coming alive and shaking and off, off you go. And you're not yeah. even going that quick. But it's and that's just what real that's what bikes should be. Uh, you yeah, know, I loved it. It's what loved you were it. saying about you know that bikes bikes can be too refined, especially yeah. the brand new, you know, fully stock bikes. Yeah. Um, I you know I want to smell a smell the yeah. petrol, smell the exhaust fumes. I want to hear the induction roar yeah. on a carburetor bike. Um, I want to feel it through you my know, body. You I want to feel on that, that bike. like the. I, I was lucky enough to get the Northman back um, to, that I built. Uh, for, for everyone else, uh, mm -hmm. I built a bike called the Northman. It was my first boutique bike, first high budget bike. And um, it had been on display, the customer who is local, um, which is lovely. It stayed in Yorkshire. Um, but he's basically just had it on display um, for a couple of years now. Um, and he's finally said, right, it's, it's waste time to ride it. So he brought me back to recommission. So, um, I uh, I recommissioned it free of charge because it, it's just it was just a joy to work on it again. Um, but I thought I, I asked him. I said I'm going to take it out for a ride. Um, just make sure it's all it's all working fine. But it might be an extended shakedown. I might put a few miles on it, and he was fine. Um, so and I got back from that, and just like you said, I just the joy of yeah. riding that again. For everyone who doesn't know, it was a it was a nineteen seventy eight CB five fifty, um, but we'd had a we did a full race rebuild on the engine. We did four into two, uh, sorry, two into four. We had McCuny V thirty four carburetors, so two great big McCuny carburetors from Murray's Carbs over in Salem in the states. Um, with their, um, we got their prototype inlet manifolds. Um, we did a four into two into one exhaust on it. And the bike was half the weight of the stock bike when we'd finished it. And mate, it was, it was insane. Um, but you could, you could smell the fuel, the burnt fuel. You could, you, you could hear the induction roar on the Murray carbs. It, it, it was like the turbo sound, you know, you get this, oh. Whereas you put your, you know, you throttle down. Yeah. Front wheels trying desperately to lift as you come out around about, um, you know, and we had a jigs the front end on that, um, you know, with two big disc brakes of the stopping power. Um, but I loved riding that. And that was everything. That That's what the joy is for me. It's, it's that, you know, the smell, the feel, the yeah. power, yeah. the, you know. The experience, and it's just a the little whole experience. A little old five fifty and what we did what I did to that bike, um, you know, just changed it completely. Somebody said it was like Trigger's broom, right? <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> five new handles and four new yeah, so. on it. It was still the same broom. But, you know, it made a hell of a bike. And I yeah, that that was the joy you're talking about. I experienced again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I've missed it. And mm. I think that's that's maybe why I enjoyed riding the Gixxer again today, because it just yeah. feels it feels so raw compared to all the modern bikes that I'm normally riding these days. Mm. That it, which is dark because it's you know still a 2011 technology bike. So it's you know, it's still got technology built in, but nothing mm. compared to what is out there today. I just yeah. loved it. Just really enjoyed it. <laughs> Okay. Oh, maybe a custom G uh, Jexer of some kind. That'd be, be interesting. interesting. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. What could you do with one of them? I don't know. I mean, because it's a. I mean, you could you could go the retro route with one, fairly easy, and have it a Jixer at heart, but with classic looks. Mm. Um, you wouldn't want to. You wouldn't want to spoil that raw sort of racing sort of vibe, would you, that you get on a Jixxer? Um, yeah. I mean, like, back to what you're saying about Harley. Harley's still on my tick list. I still need to do one. Is it? I'm, yeah, I'm, not, a, I'm not a massive fan of – I'm not a big fan of Harleys in general. Mm -hmm. It's not really my scene, especially sort of the chopper scene. Um, but um, 
I do. I love the engines. I love those big, you know, V twins. Um, mm. I would like to do something with one, but it would involve stripping it right back. Yeah, yeah. Um, f- frame an engine. I'd probably do some that every Harley driver would rider would hate and put clip-ons on it. <laughs> oh, you know those bobbers, you know those Harley bobbers with the yeah, yeah. clip-on bars, single seat, just n- no mud guards, no fenders, just an engine and a frame. I'd probably do that too, I think. Yeah. Or do it. Do it. Oh, it's a sports or something. <laughs> Anyone yeah. out there with a bike and you want it customised, if you got that Harley, get in touch with Jonathan. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, just for that, Andy. Next one, Rob Mack. Evening, guys. Hope you're both well. Jonathan, great to meet you at the Scottish Motorcycle Show last year. The oh, new bless decks you. look great, and I'm loving the way the CRF has turned out. Here's my question If money was no object, what bike would you love to give the hull treatment to? Well, we kind of followed that from the last one. Money, no yeah. object, then. Well, I mean, I'm lucky. I'd I'd love to build uh, I'd love to build my own bike, and I think it's about time now that I did that, and then I could keep you know and have have a bike in stock all the time if you like. Yeah. Um, but I am lucky that I get to build. I already get to build very high end sort of sort of bikes that I wouldn't be able to usually afford. I mean mm. the the K the K one hundred, you know my show bikes start at 20k you know and they uh, um and they always got the very best sort of technologies and the best techniques in them and the best people contractors um you know i I get to work with like tom hurley you know who's who's clearly the best upholsterer in the uk um if not beyond um is he the one that did your seat the brown yeah Yeah, oh, I'm man, going, that was beautiful. The, he, he did the K100, um, the Hockenheim, this yeah. one, um, and he's done the CRF seat. And uh, you know, I'm lucky that I get. I'm at, I'm at a level now where I get to work with those people, and um, you know, it's uh, so. Yeah, I'd like to. Build, I'd like to have the money to build my to build myself one of my mm. show bikes. You mm. know, but. I currently don't have 20 grand to throw at a bike. Yeah, yeah, no, I get it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I would like, if if money was no object, I'd buy a power brick. I, I'd, I'd go to Tim at power brick and I'd have one of his, I think. Um, so it's not like if, if I could build a bike, um, this is just bikes I'd like to own. I'd like to own a power brick. Um, K one hundred. I'd like to own one of Bob's uh, Tiger Cubs. Mm-hmm. Um, they're just beautiful things. This is function follows form. Nothing about what, and this is the same with the Minovation G fifties. There's nothing on them that doesn't serve a very specific function, but they are built to such a quality that they are beautiful. Mm-hmm. They're beautiful things. You you know, even if you're not in the bikes, you look at these these bikes and think that's that's an incredible piece of kit. Yeah. Um, and you've never seen a tiger cub like, you know, like Bob's. Um, so yeah, I would like to invest in, in probably in, if, if money was no object, I'd be invested in some of my favorite builders, uh-huh. you know, motorcycles, I think. Yeah okay. yeah. okay. But I do have a very long tick list of bikes I want to build. <laughs> yeah. Rob has a second question, which really took my eye when I was reading out the first one. He says, What's the question you want to ask most to whom and why? Oh, my word. I could have done with some notice for this one. (laughs) What's the question I'd like to ask? The most. And who would you ask it to and why them? And why them? Or maybe not necessarily why them, but why? why? Why are you asking them that question? Or why are you asking that question to them? Maybe that's the best way of phrasing it. I mean, you could say something really profound, couldn't you, to somebody like somebody notorious? Um, but I don't know. I'd need to think that through. Wow, off the cuff. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot of you know. There's a lot of horrible, notorious people throughout history. You want to ask why to? Um, yeah. <laughs> but or but I don't know. 
I want to give it an answer, do but it. I can't. I can't yeah, think I of do. anything. I can't think I of anything off the cuff, like you said. You know, like. Geez. I mean, I I'd love to speak to some of those old engineers. Like, I don't know whether there's a you know they have to be alive or whether for your question, Robert. But you know, I'd love to know what was going through the mind of some of those like Brunel and you know some of those old pioneers, those engineering pioneers. Mm-hmm. Um, that it, it just invented these crazy things, figured them out. It's that for me. It's things you know. like it's things like the pyramids, stone circles, all this sort of stuff. You know, all these ancient buildings and and constructions that you see. I want to know, like, what what is the actual purpose of it? What what why why were these built? Well, no, we've got you know, all these different I, conspiracy theories, but why were they built and how were they built? I don't think I'm a conspiracy theorist. I mean, you made a joke about it before. I don't think I'm a conspiracy theorist, but I do think I have an eye for a con. Mm-hmm. Um, I would like to know what's going on at Area 51, though, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, 100%. I think that yeah. there's more there going on there. Yeah, I don't know. Is it Little Green Men? I don't know. I don't no, know. but uh, yeah. I think we have technology that is way, oh, way beyond, way beyond way what we're allowed. Yeah. yeah, what we're allowed to see. Yeah. 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 Uh, great question. I am going to ponder that. And if I come up with an answer, I'll post it on my socials. We're not going to sleep for weeks now, are we? No, I'm not. No, no. <laughs> right. Last one from Patreon. And there's a couple on Instagram. Are you okay for time, mate? Absolutely fine, yeah. Right, well, mind you, we did go on for about two and a half hours last time, didn't we? So we should probably aim for it. We did. We did. <laughs> uh, next one, Chris in Dubai. Hello, gentlemen. How are you doing, Chris? Hi, Chris. Lately, I hear the term, oh, this is too much power, or this is all the power you need, quite often from various people. Do you agree with this, or do you also feel that more is better? Obviously, we all want different things, but personally, I like a bike to be exciting and a little bit scary. Okay. Okay, these days, too much um, power? Depends what it is, right? Mm. I uh, Power and, and speed are exciting, obviously. Yeah. And that's probably why we're all on a, on a bike, you know. But it depends... We've spoke about this before as well. I can have I can have a joyful time on a one two five one fifty one ninety, yep. and I, I I can happily just have a, a lovely lovely time riding, throwing one around, be it green laning or you know just round a town or a city. Um, but the other side of that, I mean, I'm lucky. I get to ride so many different types of bikes. Like oh. I guess it's the same as you. Um, but there's nothing like, you know, straight line speed. I got I got to ride the Hockenheim. I don't know whether you clocked that. I got the opportunity to run it down a runway. Oh, I don't think I've um, seen that. I just I just built it because it was off the cuff. Um, um, we'd gone for a photo shoot at the local airfield, who I've got a good connection with now, um, and uh, we were photographing the Hockenheim in the in the hangars, um, and then the guy that was uh, the ground crew, head of ground crew there, who was shifting planes around for us, says, oh, well, if I jump in the uh, the fire tender with your photographer, why don't you rip it down the runway a couple of times? I had no leathers, no helmet, no nothing. <laughs> so my brain was telling me this is a terrible idea. My heart was saying, if you miss this opportunity, you're not, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. When, do, when do you get to rip a bike you built yeah. down a runway, you know, on a private left airstrip? So I don't don't do this at home, ladies and gentlemen. But I chose to do it, and it it was just incredible, you know, just being able to, you know, bomb it down. Um, so yeah, I think bike riding is a joy. You can find it anywhere, on any bike. Um, so power and speed is great, but you know. I can have just as much fun on a 125. There's there's my answer. Uh, I, 100% I agree with you. I kind of, mm. I don't subscribe to, you know, you, you're not a biker unless you do this. You're If you own one of these bikes, you're this type of person. If you own that type of bike, you're that. I don't subscribe to mm. any of that. It's just bollocks. Oh, no, I, absolutely, just, yeah. yeah. It's just, um, I don't care what I'm riding, whether it's got three wheels, two wheels, 
one wheel, four wheel. I don't care. If I'm enjoying it, I'm enjoying it. And it, it's got bugger all to do. Sometimes it's because it's got a load of grunt and it's got a load of power. And yeah, you know, tickles me nuts and puts a massive grin on my face. But as, yeah. as you just said, I can be riding a 125cc, screaming the nuts off this thing and going at 25 yeah. mile an hour. And I am having the time of my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, it's just, I think these days, CCs a bit are of, all uh, having to go up for because of emissions you know they're, they're having to put yeah. the ccs up in order to mm. for us to get that those facts and figures that everyone chases or a lot of people chase you know they want mm. certain bhp they want certain torque well to get that with these increasing emissions standards and the restrictions they impose they haven't up the the they've, they've got to up the cc in order to you know to still give us these headline figures that people seem to want so you know that's why the power's going up isn't it well it is yeah and and you've got one thing i did learn when i was at innovation is that horsepower you know mm. horsepower is meaningless if it's not applied right yeah um so you can have these engines that produce massive horsepower um but if it's not applied to the back of the rear wheels right then you know you, it, it doesn't mean anything yeah. um that you know so and and racing engineers know that um so yeah it's um people that aren't in the know you know rely on those figures and they're all yeah. punted out to us and it was a clever piece of marketing the guy that uh the guy that invented i can't remember his name the guy that invented horsepower uh as a reading um he uh he wanted something to market and that's why that's why he came up with that oh, um, right. something that was easy for people to um picture one mm. horse two horse three horses so yeah, on, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know um so it was a marketing scheme in itself uh but uh, clever but yeah so we have to be careful careful of the numbers careful of the figures you know get on a bike and ride it you know don't don't Do make you your choice yeah, yeah don't make your choice until you've got it or got on it and ridden it um, I, I, I was a bit prejudiced about the old adventure bikes before I got on that one. And I, um, you know, it was a stock bike and I really enjoyed it. And now I can see myself being an adventure biker. So, you know, <laughs> you're going you to get yourself a peak lid in a rocker suit, says the man that has Maybe. a peak lid in a rocker suit. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. It happens to us all. <laughs> happens to us all. Yeah. Um, Right. Okay. So that's us done over on Patreon. Thank you very much to everyone in the clan over there for those Thank questions. Thank you. It was fun. We've got a last few over on uh, Instagram. I don't think there's any on Facebook when we started. No, I don't think there is. No. Um, but we've got some on Instagram. So King Bespoke Creations. Chris, how you doing, Chris? Question for Jonathan. What do you think will be the next trend? Classic tourers, retro adventure bikes? Discuss. Ah, this was the question I was talking about. Um, and I don't know. I think um, the new wave scene that I've, as Rebecca said, this new wave scene that I've fallen into um, is is clearly here to stay. Mm. It was, um, you know, it, coming out of COVID, that sort of times, it got really big because people were fascinated by these seeing these beautiful pictures of bikes on, you know, stripped back new wave calves on, on Instagram and socials. And it really took a big boost. And the worry for those of us in the scene was that if that was going to disappear, um, you know, post post COVID, whether that boom was going to die down, mm. um, you know, people like uh, the bike shed and, um, and Malay and um, have, have kept that sort of scene alive, but, it's it's less about i think it's less about the looks now well it is no it's, it is about looks and style but it's got to be about function and the best bikes now that you see at the show is the best new wave customs are just beautifully engineered bikes and that mantra i keep saying of, of uh, form follows function um i don't know about trends and you know, it goes up and down. I mean, there's, there was one time when I first started in the scene that all you'd see was R100s, R100s, mm -hmm. R100s, you know, and I still want to build one. I still want a tick list. Um, but um, 
and you, you sort of do get those trends. And then we got in, then all of a sudden it was scramblers and then flat trackers more recently. Um, but they were all within this new wave scene. Um, so the, the, the style shifts within the new wave scene, the style shifts a lot. I don't know where it's going next. What instigates I think this something. then? What instigates I don't know. style? I don't know. It's just, I, I guess somebody just comes up with a beautiful bike and everyone goes, oh, I want to build one of those. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Like, um, yeah, when I, when I first started, it was all calf races, right? It was all stripped back calves. Then we all sort of moved into scramblers and we're all like, wow, massive, you know, big trials bike tires on them and, and, you know, high handlebars and, you know, brat seats and getting into those scrambler things. And then it shifted like a couple, like a year ago, we started seeing those flat trackers come up and, and there was some beautiful, like classic flat tracker builds. Um, and uh, uh, some of the guys that, you know, Anthony Partridge and Stib Knight Moho and those people were building brilliant flat trackers. Um, and then it's sort of, it's coming back around again. We're back on sort of calves. Um, but they're evolving all the time. I don't know about, I can't really speak on the chopper scene or anything like that, but uh, it's kind of fluid. Um, and we all kick off each other, you know. Mm. If Ziggy Moto comes up with a design and it goes mad and everyone's like, wow, he's, you know, because he's a cool designer, um, you know, then it might take another change or one of the, you know. Yeah. It only takes, you, it only takes somebody to build a, like a, just a beautiful example of some at left field and then, then people want to emulate it, you know. Do you, do you follow car designs? Uh, don't follow, no, but I, yeah, I, I, I see them. Uh, I, I I love some of his. I had him on the podcast, and I, I love some of his um, his uh, conceptual designs that he comes up with. And then how, yeah. like some of the manufacturers, actually then go and build them. They see yeah. they see his yeah. design ideas, and then they they grab hold of it and go, "Yeah, all right, let's go with that." Mm. So, car. Well, that's what I like are, about that's what I like about Ziggy because he'll he will yeah. he's a designer by trade, so uh, digital designer. So he he will he will do a full digital creation of his bike. The difference yeah. for Ziggy is he'll then go away and build it and it and will look it. exactly the same. Yeah. Wow. I mean, he's a, such a talented man, you know, um, you but yeah, that's what's, that's what's cool. Do you think with the death of, I don't know why I'm thinking this cause I've got absolutely no uh, like knowledge, insight or qualifications in your, your, your sector at all. But I'm just thinking to myself, Sports bikes are pretty much dead now. They, they, there seems to be the odd little, like they just released that R9, but I mean, it's... People are, and I think what would be interesting if we saw that 80s, that early 80s sports bike shape, you know, that's, I'm seeing glimpses yeah. of that coming back, especially yeah. like nods to the early 70s race bikes. Um, yeah. That's I think, I'm I think I'm that, I think we might... Grab. Those, yeah. those, those like litre sports bikes and do something. I, like I would like to do sort of a, a traditional sort of classic track bike, but in all aluminium, Ooh. you know, all of the fairing in high polished coach built aluminium. I'd love to do that. Wow. Do you know what I mean? So it just looked like a silver bullet. Like, the, yeah. like that, that Norton V4, uh, was it R mm. they did? That, right. that, that brushed aluminium or chrome, it might have even been chrome, but oh my yeah, God, like highly just, polished stuff. Sort of, yeah, yeah. I mean, apparently, would, it was a bag oh. of poo mechanically, but aesthetically, to look at it, it oh, it I, I would definitely want it machine. to be, yeah, I definitely want it to be a race bike. It'd have to perform like one, but I just, yeah, I'd love to take, to take those classic racing lines, you know, the yeah. fairing and yeah, the yeah, parallel yeah. And, the, and, and have that coach built in, you know. Some air, some really high quality aerospace aluminium. There's got to I be somebody that, out there watching that would be or cool. listening who who has the wherewithal <laughs> to connect up with Jonathan here and make this happen. Ah, Come well, on. I was I was interested in doing something with Toby Southern. He's an incredibly talented coach builder, but he's 
he is disillusioned with the the motor industry, I think, and and right. he's a very talented sculptor now. He's turned his coach building into beautiful sculptures. Wow! Um, and um, and good luck to him. He's a, he's an amazingly talented guy, and he's very knowledgeable about economics as well. Which is, yeah. um, back to our prior conversation, <laughs> but yeah, it's such a skill that coach building is such a such a dying art that is, and it's such a shame to see that skill, you know disappearing is it is something like that likely to 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 come back or, or, or is it a case of once that goes that's it gone or is it is it same one with of these all this engineering that that, that's back? what i'm i i go out looking for you know like people like like martin um from innovation and bob and these are guys in their 60s 70s you know and i don't i i don't want their their skills and to die with them you know mm, mm-hmm. uh, i just want to learn as much as i can off off people and working in 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 a traditional engineering shop i mean minovation have like five axis cnc machines state of the art one side and then the other side of the factory was just you know 100 year old myfords and bridgeports um proper manual engineering machinery um and the the old guys that worked in there the knowledge they have is just insane you know they have mm-hmm. in their heads what the computers and the program you know the, the computers are using today but they can do it they they can just go to a manual machine and they can make something yeah you know and they have the knowledge to do that and that's absolutely incredible i think what we're going to lose engineering wise is the process and that knowledge and that skill, mm. we're all going to be just relying on a computer to figure that out for us. Yeah, yeah. And I, th- I think that's, that's a bit of a shame. I know it's progress. You know, mm. you don't, as it's great. You don't have to learn the skill anymore. A computer does it for you. But, you know, yeah. no, I, 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 I kind of get a kick out of it and uh, being able to create something out of nothing. Yeah. You know, start with creativity. That's what I said with, we, we, me and Gus had this conversation. I don't know how we got onto this, but uh, me and Gus had this conversation. You know, you start with a flat piece of sheet steel or yeah. a flat piece of sheet aluminium. And at the end of the day, you have created something beautiful and tangible out of that mm. flat piece mm. of sheet steel. That's a big turn on for me. I, I love that, you know, getting creative, make it, building something out of nothing. Or getting on a machine be. and turning a big lump of aluminium into a, you know, if, even if it's something as simple as a drop pin or, a, you know, an that's got to be incredibly like rewarding that. for you. It is like just just on a like like on a basic level for for a creative person to create something. It, it's got to be food for the soul, isn't it? It has to be. Yes, I mean, that, that light fit in there, no, that yeah, didn't yeah. exist. That started as a flat sheet seal, as you've, yeah. if, you, if you follow the build process, you know. I mean, it's simple. It's just a, you know, googly eye light fit. But, you know, it started, it wasn't, it didn't exist before. Now it does. So, yeah, it is a big, just simple things like that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Uh, second last question. Gary Wallace, 68. It's not really a question. He just says, one of the nicest blokes on the scene and I watched them build some incredible looking bikes. Proud to call him my mate. Wishing you all the best for the future. P.S. Dude, we're way, way too old for hammocks. Come on. What's this mean? This is the <laughs> right. Thank you, Gary. You're a, you're a beautiful man. Um, right. Do I explain the hammocks? Um, I, uh, the, two years ago, I went to the bike shed. And it was one of those tough times and I didn't have enough money to splash out on a hotel room in the middle of London at yeah. showtime. So I found this little campsite in the 15 minutes out of the center of London. And I can't remember the name of it now. I've been asked, but it was this little oasis in the middle of this sort of normal sort of housing estate. You, you went down this road, you turned right after a big row of terraces and all of a sudden you're in this oasis, this this campsite that you could be in the middle of the Lake District or whatever. It's crazy. Wow. And um, this is 15 minutes out of the centre of the city of London. Um, so I stayed there for a few nights. Um, and it was I had this little tent, but it was freezing. Um, so I... Uh, I got I, I got a hammock I'd bought it years ago and I I just threw it in the back 
So what I did is I, 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 I spanned it between the two corners of my van. So in the back of the transit, and I, I slept in the hammock all weekend. And if I, I don't know whether you ever slept in a hammock, Bruce, have you? No, I've not, no. There's a reason the sailors used to do it all the time. It's brilliant. I, I mean, I, you get, you're off the ground for starters, and it's, it's such a comfy night's sleep. The reason he's brought it up now is because that hammock is now swinging in my office. <sighs> so I, I did an all-nighter down here a couple of weeks back. I did an all-nighter on this. Um, I had a lot of painting and finishing to do. So rather than, you know, just trudging through it over several days, like painting and then going and then lacquering and then, you know, rather than stretching it out, I decided to do an all nighter. And I, I got, I got up every two hours and recoated. Yeah. Um, and I slept in the hammock, I slept in the hammock up in the office. Um, and it was nice. It was a nice bonding experience, you know, oh, yeah, I get that. In, in my space. Um, and it got the job done. And uh, yeah. So if you haven't tried sleeping in a hammock, I, I recommend it. Yeah, I, I it, getting, out, getting in and out of it is a bit of an issue. Yeah, yeah, when you're exactly, out. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not exactly uh, del- uh, not not delicate. What's the word? Did you see that um, that that Instagram? I think it was a TikTok thing that went viral of the guy that put one up in, in a bus. <laughs> and then in a bus? Got in it. Yeah, he put, he put his, swung his hammock in a bus and then got in it and wrapped itself in, <laughs> wrapped himself up. And everyone was going crazy telling him to take his hammock down and he wouldn't. He got really gross. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Watch this. Hammock sales are going to go soar through the roof. Right, yeah, last one. Real Schwerty. Bruce, you didn't get to my question when you had Kate on, so I repeat it. Please explain to your guest and all of us why Yellowstone is such a great show. Oh, come on. Have you so watched are, are Yellowstone? You a, are you a fan of Yellowstone? Love it. Absolutely. Is that why it. he's asking? I, I think it must be. Yeah, I think I've gone on about it a few times on podcasts. Ah, right. I mean, I'm also a big fan. I do. I do. That's my wind down. What yeah. My wind, wind down time at night um, when the kids are in bed. Um, is uh, I watch a lot of box sets and stuff, and I love I love sort of dramas. Um, yeah, Yellowstone was amazing, but I do feel cheated um, yes. because you know you get like well, it didn't resolve anything at all, and it just stopped halfway through the last season. Was it five or yeah, four? halfway okay. through season five? <laughs> yeah, and it just stopped, back. and then is it though? Yeah, November. Kevin. Kevin's been up and down on it, hasn't he, Mr. Costner? Costner um, is not so coming back. He's, he said right. he's not coming back. So it's going to be without okay. him. But in November, I think it restarts. Oh, well, that's interesting. I mean, is mm. it Yellowstone without him? Um, be interesting, wouldn't it? I mean, what an yeah. ending it was, though. You're like, Well, not even an ending, but the last episode that, it, that yeah. was on there, you were just like, oh, my good God. This is going yeah. to be like the end of days, whatever's going to happen here. Yeah, I like, I like those... Beth's oh, she's, a, like she's an amazing woman, isn't she? Oh, I mean, wow, yeah. you know, um, she's she's a Brit, she's British as well. Yeah. Apparently, she's a British actor. Right. Okay, yeah. yeah. Wow. Dangerous, dangerous, crazy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I like her. <laughs> yeah, um, Schwerty, I'm sorry I never got to your question, mate. But we had an insane amount of questions uh, when Kate was on using in Kate, so. Um, we, I think we, I don't think we even did all the patron questions, so there's right. no chance we could get to any of the other social media. Oh, bless ones. you! Yeah. I'll tell you what's well, been good. Um, what I've been enjoying back on, if we're talking about TV, yeah, go on. Um, ah, what's it called on on Apple? Slow Horses. I do, I do enjoy that. I've not seen it. I've not watched any Apple TV yet. Uh, Gary Oldman, because okay. uh, he he plays a MI5. Um, like an, an ex MI5 agent who runs a company of misfits called Slow Horses. It's very mm. cool. Very cool. And Gary Oldman's just gold dust, isn't he? Have you watched any of the offshoots from Yellowstone? No, no, there's a few, isn't there? No, I haven't. There's about quite. four or five, I think. Excuse me. Right. I've watched them all, love them all, but, but they're, they're still not Yellowstone. You know, it's like, no, come are you on, a I'm cowboy? Yellowstone. Are you a cowboy at heart, are you, Gus? I, yeah, I, I, think, I think I am. Like, like I watch, I watch things like you know Outlander or or like Brave when Braveheart was out, and I'm like, I, I, that's mm. me. Just take me back to those days, you know, like the simple life. I'd love that. And then I watch yeah. things like Yellowstone or anything to do with the cowboy sort of like you know just being at one, just out on the land and just getting on with it. I like. Yeah, I can hear that. Yeah, 
I don't know if I'd be any good at it, but you know, I, I, I like, I find that way of life very appealing. Mm. But then I'm sat in my nice house with internet and on-demand food and a TV yeah. and heating. Yeah, you know? yeah. So when you're sat shivering your nuts off under a tree in the way in the rain, having to kill whatever <laughs> you're going to eat, maybe it's not going to be that romantic after that. But <laughs> I like the idea of it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Awesome. Dude, that's all the questions. We've done them. Smashed them. Oh, that's been uh, that's been Pretty absolutely lovely. Two hours, happy days. It's not a bad length, that. Huh? Um, Has it really been that long again? It's about that, yeah. I think we're coming on two hours now, yeah. So, yeah. if people want to find out more about Jonathan Hull and Son, where do they go? What do they do? Um, well, I'm active as always on Instagram. Um, that's my chosen sort of um, outlet. Um, for sort of my my social media posts, um, I have all the other social accounts, but they're not as, they're not monitored as closely as my Instagram account. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to see what if you're just interested to see what I do, then that's the place to be. If you want to get in touch, then it's JonathanHall.co.uk. Um, if you if you go on my pro Instagram profile, there's a link tree that has all of my uh, details in it, um, all the relevant places and a contact form and all that. Um, yeah, so that's where I get me. As always, folks, all those links will be down below. Um, Jonathan, if someone was interested interested in having uh, a custom bike built by you, what sort of lead time are you, are you looking at? Is that in, can you say that, or is it entirely dependent on? It's, in, what the it's entirely is? dependent on what what the project is. Um, sure. And I've learned, you know. If it's one of my smaller bikes, I, I can do them in three, you know, three months on the inside, six months on the outside, um, depending on how busy I am. I'm a, I'm a one man entity. Um, the bigger, you know, bespoke show bikes take time and it depends on the projects. Um, gotcha. But yeah, so it can be six months, it can be eight. It depends what it is. Um, and the budget that we have and all that sort of stuff. So um, if you are interested in, you know, I guess owning a a singularity, a one-off, beautiful custom, then get in touch with your ideas, and, and we'll have a chat. That's how it works. See awesome. where if we and if we are in line, then uh, then there you go, job's done. Mate, I'm I'm so chuffed to see how things have turned out over the last year or so since we last spoke, and I can't wait to see what beautiful bikes you come up with over the next year or so. It's going to be awesome. Well, man. thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, show season will soon be upon us. I mean, it's build season now, I guess, for for, for most, and then uh, getting ready for next year. Um, I might. I don't know whether I'll end up using this for, you know, asking the client if he uh, if he might use that next. Mm. Um, it will be going down to the bike shed though very soon. That one. So when's the bike shed? When's that? Oh, the show is. Um, the show's not till the end of May next year now. Um, but uh, yeah, this one is is heading down to the Shoreditch branch when it's also done. it's going to be in the actual uh, bike shed itself. Well, we're doing yeah, we, we're well, we're going to be doing. Um, I don't think I can say too much about it. It's okay. a bit hush -hush, awesome. but uh, it'll be heading it'll be heading yeah. to Shoreditch shortly. <laughs> Follow his socials. You'll yeah, find yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> yeah, All right, awesome. Mate. Um, any shout outs you want to give? Any plugs you want to give? Feel free. Um. I want to say hi to Alan, Kilted Bushido. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's a very close friend of mine. Um, uh, just a big shout out to everybody who's supported me over the years. Um, like there's people like Stu Winterburn have been following me. Um, uh, India Alessandra, who the the person who designed my beautiful logo. Um, all those years ago, still going strong, and she's still supporting me. Um, yeah, it's just. It's over. It's overwhelming sometimes. You know, you you're just doing what you do, and then you get people yeah. that send you the, like lovely messages. And um, I've been lucky with the support that I've had over the years. Um, and yeah, thanks, to my wonderful family who couldn't be doing any of this without. Yeah, awesome, mate. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Credit where credit's due for you as well, because you know none of this happens without the, the passion, the drive. Uh, and the the talent, the basic talent, really that mm. that you have in order to push the dream. So you know, 
awesome. It's great to see what you've well, thank done you. with it that's, so that's, far. That's and lovely to catch up with you too. And you, man. And you, you keep doing what you're doing. And when you open the first international branch, it'll be great to uh, chat with you then as well. Awesome. Yeah, I'll love back if I mind. <laughs> All right, bud, look after yourself, mate. All right, it's been right, great man. having you on. Folks, Thank hope you've you. enjoyed this one. I, uh, again, as I said, I'll leave all Jonathan's links down below, so make sure you give him a like, a follow. And uh, as he said, if you think you might be in the market for having a custom-built bike, then drop my line and see where you go with that. All right, folks, keep doing your thing. Keep looking after those that you love. Get on out there whenever you can, but most importantly, live your life. Woo-ha!